Neil, obviously, uh, I and many in the world are a huge fan of your work and I've had great fun um, uh, watching this film again, even watching tonight, seeing it on, on the big screen and uh, doing my research, listening to your director's commentary. So some of your own words you'll hear back. And one of the things that made me smile on the um, director's commentary was that you say filmmaking and demolition are equally satisfying, which I thought was a very interesting um, uh, thing to say and that you, and you certainly have excelled in both. And um, they say write about what you know, and uh, is that the case for you? Um, I suppose so, really, in a way, you know, but I mean, you, you can never, you, you couldn't really just write your own life because it would be very dull, you know. But, um, there was an, there's an image in that film that we put in, because I, I did work in Demolition Place in London once, and I remember smashing a wall down and seeing this kind of cricket pitch emerge behind the all of the dust and smoke, you know, this rather yes. idyllic image of England, it was very strange, so I put that in the film, so it's... I thought it was really powerful because it's like he's breaking through a window and kind of it opens the, yeah. almost the second act of the film as, as she it, walks yeah. across the, the... Well, that actually did happen, I, did, I, I didn't see a beautiful thing walk across the yeah. screen, I saw a lot of fat guys in whites throwing cricket balls and all that stuff, you know. Um, I know there was a huge challenge in, in funding the film, but before we get to that, can you tell me what were the challenges in writing it? What was the genesis of the idea? What came first, the, the world or what became known as the secret in the film? Oh, the, the, I, I wrote the script. Um, can you, you can hear your voice bouncing back there, can't yes, you? Yes. A bit like being in a rock concert or something. Yeah. But I, I, wrote, I began to write the script uh, several times and uh, it went through I think it's very easy to begin stories you know but if you write films it's it's very easy to find arresting beginnings and it's very difficult to find the energy that will take you through you know the full kind of mythic breath that a story needs and I mean I began this script about somebody who kidnapped a soldier and uh, was uh, was kind of to blame for his death, his accidental death. I don't even know if he, was he, he shot him in the original thing I wrote. And then I wanted the story to move to London, but every time it moved to London, I always wanted the guy to look with, you know, out of a sense of guilt to approach the soldier's wife. Yeah, originally I called it the soldier's wife, you know. And every time I, I began to write the London section of it, it became it became almost a social realist film, you know, that the kind of film that somebody else would have made very well, but perhaps not me, you know, and I just would put it away. And one day, one day I thought, okay, if I turn this guy, this, the wife was always a hairdresser, you know, he always went and saw this when he went to get his hair cut and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, well, if I turn this woman into a man, you know, into a transvestite, what would happen to the story and it suddenly made the confinement that existed in the beginning of the story, it made it all strangely questionable and emotional and strangely kind of ironic and uh, it made the political, the ordinary social realist political dimension of the story have a totally different kind of resonance, you know, so then I finished it rather quickly. but. Uh, it's often that way, way when you write things, you know, you have a few ideas of hanging around in your head for five or six years and suddenly they, they do something different and they begin to make sense, you know. And that is, kind of becomes the genius of the idea in, in, in terms of it's a different way of exploring uh, themes that certainly for an Irish audience that we are familiar with in terms of politics and, yeah. and identity. And then the film actually becomes really an exploration of desire and about um, a man going on a journey who is changed because he's open to change because of what, of what he goes through. It also ironically became uh, uh, what made the film difficult to get financed. So the genius yeah. became the problem. Well, it's not that. It's, it's more like... You take this uh, guy, his name is Fergus, you know, and you can understand what that implies. He's a nationalist, he's a Catholic, he's, in his case, he's an IRA volunteer. And uh, 
I'm probably deeply conservative human being. You know, I don't want to be pejorative about anybody, but you know, he's probably kind of Porrick Pierce kind of figure in some way. And you try and subject him with every possible assault you can to his definition of himself, you know. And I suppose the biggest assault you can put to his definitions of himself is having fallen in love with a woman who turns out to be a man. Do you understand what I mean? And in a, in a way, the um, writing the script was kind of an attempt to see will anything survive of this human being if you hit him with all these things, you know. And that kind of became the game of it in a way, you know. And when you were writing the film and uh, d desperately trying to get it funded, did you know it was going to be great? Or is that something that as a writer you always have to just believe in the core idea? Because you had so many challenges to make um, uh, Dill a woman, played by a woman. You had to write an alternative ending, um, not kill uh, Jody in the opening 30 minutes. I mean, constant challenges in order to get it funded. And how did you... Well, that, that's a different question, really. I mean, you don't know why um, a film like that becomes a, you know, uh, speaks to people in different cultures. I mean, I just made a film before that called The Miracle, which which I loved, you know, but uh, nobody in the world went to see it. And you can't ever work out why some people go to see some film and some uh, some people don't go to see another. I mean, it's it's a mystery to me, and I would defy anybody, defy anybody to to uh, make sense of it. You know, it, it it's just something to do with popular culture, or, you know, something to do with the zeitgeist of things, you know. In fact, when we released The Crying Game in Britain, we, we released it in England before we released it in America, and it wasn't particularly well received, and very few people went to see it. And after it became a success in America, they re-released it in England, and everybody went to see it, you know, so yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a series of accidents that are outside of your control, really, you know, but I mean, my job as a writer and a filmmaker is just to make Get, get it as right as possible, you know what I mean? And I just want to pay a particular tribute to Stephen Woolley, your producer in this film, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. But, um, I mean, the passion and the commitment and conviction that Stephen had to get this film made and this belief in you and in, in, in the script. And, I mean, famously, he wrote to Channel 4 saying, threatening that he'd be a... Uh, a funeral pyre in the um, a human pyre in the uh, in the lobby uh, if they if they didn't fund it. Did you say that? <laughs> Seemingly he. But he also got me to write a really bad ending, you know. Uh, well. And he that... insisted I shoot it, and we had no money, and I was saying, please, this is not going to be in the film. This is absurd. And, but deep know. down, did he know that as well as you? But it was part no, of the didn't. game. No, he, he didn't. He didn't actually. You know. Okay, well that's really bad. Directors know more than producers, but no. uh, <laughs> I think we, when we were shooting it. Here, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, a marriage like that with Stephen for a for a writer director. I mean, is that good luck? Is that how much do you work on that relationship? I mean, it's more you see the things you kind of see a possibility set of possibilities that other people don't see. You know, I suppose Stephen grew up in England, and um, obviously he grew up in England. He, he ran a cinema called the Scala. He he was a fan of genre movies, you know, so it's, which hasn't been always a staple of, you know, English filmmaking. Um, and uh, he loved Emmerich Powell and Pressburger, he loved all the Hammer movies, he obviously loved all the Ealing films, and I don't think he was looking too fond of the costume drama, rather serious kind of aspect of uh, the British cinema, you know, so um, our sensibilities kind of gelled in that way, you know. And, I mean, there are great stories of, because when you started filming, you started filming, there wasn't a, um, there was no insurance for the film. I mean, at the time I shared a uh, uh, house with the guy who was the clapper loader on the film, so I'd hear the stories in the evening, and the secret was so well kept, it wasn't until the crew picture at the end, he said, how good looking do you think she is? And uh, he finally, finally revealed uh, uh, the truth of that character, but obviously everybody was sworn to secrecy. But um, that uh, that Stephen literally was going taking the cash uh, cash. Yes, but I've just finished a film called Byzantium with Stephen, and it was equally difficult. Oh, okay. So it just seems to be yeah. like, well, there doesn't seem to be any money for good stuff, you know. Once ah. you do a good movie, you're you're just like you have to sell your house basically to make it, you know. And um, the. 
how, when all of that tension was going on with the, you know, trying to get the money in the background, and even now in Byzantium, how do you, how do you, you keep your your head and focus on set with all of that going? Well, the good the good thing is, if it's a small firm, you you only have uh, it's quite easy to, um, to to control the animal that it is. You know, if it's a big Hollywood movie, and you've got big stars who are being paid more than you, you know, it's it's more difficult to make sure you shape it the way you see it. You know, but if it's a, if it's a small film, it's you know generally possible to uh, at least make sure that. The, that you shoot exactly what you want. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, it's like, yeah. And do you believe in um, that if there's a, a poverty of, of means, that there's a purity in the execution? Or is that just an, an excuse for producers or executives saying, work harder and work cheaper? No, I mean, generally, the, more, the less money you spend, the more control you have, you know? But um, so, some, some films demand, you know, epic scale, and some films demand visual splendor. I mean, the crying game, what was good about that was that actually, it, you know, it could have that stripped down aesthetic and it could, uh, it, it, it was in many ways a virtue to the, you know, the, the ideas that the film was dealing with. Uh, I mean, some of the choices, I, I think the filmmaking in it is, is beautiful. It's got such grace and, and, and confidence and... Um, I mean, I'm just interested in some of the choices you made. I mean, on a, on a, on a technical level, your, your choice to shoot it in CinemaScope, which usually is, yeah. what, you know, what's used to shoot landscape, yet you use it to... Well, it's, it's, we use big anamorphic lenses, yeah, which are they're beautiful lenses anyway, and um, they've got this real thin focal, you know, have to fo mm. focus and stuff like that, but they're great for holding two close-ups. You know, you can develop... You can, when the two guys were sitting in that... Um, in that glass house, I could design these shots which always held them both and they'd move around them and it'd be like two kind of developing close-ups all the time. And uh, if you have two people stuck in a glass house just facing each other for 20 minutes, which we had, if you use this, the, uh, the anamorphic lens correctly, you can have lovely things, you know. It's and also the way you used it in extreme close-up, I mean that very powerful sequence when um, when uh, Jody asks asks Fergus to um, to go see um, to go see Dill back, back his mouth, yeah, he's also, also been hit in the yes, mouth, so it's yes. very painful, isn't it? Yeah. It's it's really painful, and it's so powerful, it's so emotionally powerful. Yet all we're looking at are the lips and the choice, the, the, the choices you make. How much do you know exactly before you walk on on set? How, do, I mean, do you storyboard? Do you uh, how prepared are you, or how much is organic on set? We didn't. I didn't start with that film, no. But we did plan it out yes. really carefully, you know. And the designer Jim Clay was somebody who, you know, we could, you know, we could we we could design every set around how the shooting had to be, you know. Mm. It's an it's a very inarticulate process. It's hard to describe what one does, you know what I mean? But uh, you know, I did see the. I, th I saw it in three different movements, you know, the, f the first one being... Actually, we fired a cameraman, actually, on that movie. Oh, I the clapper loader kept his job, so... I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no. But w it's... Um, the opening third of it was almost like a play, yeah. and in a way it was based on a play, the, the Brenda Bean play on Gale, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, the Frank O'Connor short story. And then when it moved to London, it became almost like a comedy of misunderstandings in a way and then the last third is quite like a violent thriller really you know so it was i shot it in different ways the different sections of it and um i i asked you there how prepared you i mean how collaborative are you do you work with the same team um uh, quite often or obviously with your cast you work with stephen um a lot so is there um is there a comfort or a challenge in working with with the same people over again? Or well, the, do you have the crew list there? Do you actually? I, I don't, but I remember and there's some of them in the in the audience. And yeah, Reb and you're up there, aren't you? Mm. Did Mike Roberts work on that film? I don't remember. He didn't, did he? No, he didn't. No, Ian Wilson operated. Yeah, yeah. we started with David Lynch's cameraman. Okay, and um, he had never moved the camera before because David only moves the camera 
on a nodal point, you know. So he, f he found tremendous difficulty in dealing with the, the way I wanted to shoot things, you know. And he kind of had a bit of a, tr bit of a, a traumatic episode and he had to be replaced. So there was a cameraman called Ian Wilson who came on and he operated himself. And Ian had to take over at very short notice, you know. So, But that was the nature of the kind of film yes. it was, you know. Yeah. But, so I had to really, I suppose, be very specific about everything the camera was doing and stuff mm. like that, you know. And uh, um, on the subject of cast, because you've obviously worked with some, you know, uh, incredibly accomplished and, and, and well-known actress, but your choice, uh, Stanley Kubrick famously said that the part of Dill was uncastable, yeah. and you yeah. um, obviously proved him wrong. Well, he did, yeah. Um, yeah, he said to me, you're cast, you want to cast a guy? that'll play a girl and you want to cast a black guy that'll play a girl mm. he said and you're shooting in a month's time two months time or something uh, we found jay davidson through derek jarman actually i think derek jarman was a friend of sandy powell's the costume designer and there was a club scene in london that a lot of exotic creatures moved through and derek you know recommended him and i mean we t we tested hundreds of people and there was some quality in Jay that was uh, really really fragile and quite beautiful and um, he was a non-actor which was very important in a way mm. you, sometimes if you cast if you get the right person who's never acted before you can get a great performance out of them you know and were you nervous about that because so much of the film depends on that or you know, there's so many two-hander scenes obviously between them Jay yeah. and Stephen I, yeah. I mean do you ha have do you a difference of approach between the two yeah, you, you have to treat uh, it's like having a you know a kind of a wild deer on the set or something you know it's 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 um, but it does stimulate the actors the, the professional actors mm. in some way because the non-professional can do something that the professional has forgotten how to do and they they learn technique to approximate that first feeling, you know that kind of thing, and um, you know it can lead to very in interesting kind of tensions and interesting uh, interesting colours that emerge from different people. I mean, the main problem I had with Jay was that um, we there were a lot of transsexuals on the film, or th that we met, and that we were in this environment of all this stuff, and a lot of them were kind of doing the pre-operative stuff, you know, which I didn't know it at the time, but you take you take um, hormones before you get your thing cut off, you know, and you grow breasts and blah, 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 and all that sort of stuff, yeah. And uh, when Jay came out, when I had to do the scene where he reveals his dick, yeah, yeah. his penis, uh, he came out in a pair of, with a pair of pink satin underpants on, mm. And I thought, oh my God, he's had it cut off. I'm dead. I really, I really thought that for a moment. I thought, because I, I never, I, I tested him, and but I never asked to see him naked. You know what I mean? And I went to his dresser, who was a very, very camp man. I said, doesn't Jay realise he has to be naked in this scene? And the dresser goes, oh, he won't do that. He won't do that. You know. <laughs> like, I went. To, I said, Jay, you got to take your clothes off. It's okay, fine. So it was, but I had a moment, that's a real moment of panic there. That's, a, that's an incredible moment of panic. Mm, it was a real panic. <laughs> um, Redmond, do you mind if I call on you? Do you remember that scene on the day or just those moments of, those moments of, of, of panic and have you any anecdotes? Yes. Of course yes. I do, yes. No, I mean, I mean I, I'm not normally an assistant director. I was very extremely happy to be in, involved as Neil's assistant on, on the movie. So I, I was there for the whole, I was there for everything really. But uh, no, the, uh, the LA, the London uh, uh, Apprentice, which is the the the, um, uh, the bar that we used. I mean, all the all, all the girls in that—they were amazing. They went there. They were extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary. But it was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience to work on the film. I'm very happy to have done so. Um, I I have um, uh, a quote here from uh, Robert Quinn, who was your third, who I think. Um, uh, sums it up quite nicely. Redmond Morris asked me to come to work as third AD on a film in Laytown called The Soldier's Wife. It was all very hush-hush with the full script kept under wraps. Our first day was a scene at a fun fair. There was something magical about the set with the big wheel towering over us 
and when a man loves a woman being played over and over. What were we working on? I had no idea. Something about a soldier being kidnapped. One year later, I went to the crew showing. I wasn't expecting much. Nobody was. It was now called The Crying Game. And when the lights came up, Irish film was a different beast. Oh, thanks, Robert. <laughs> he was my third assistant. That's right. <laughs> Extremely good, but the, the, uh, there were some interesting things that that, that, that happened. For instance, I, I, I remember we went up, up to the north with the car just to do a few of, of, of the runbys, really, and just to, uh, the, the car and Neil and the cameraman and so and, uh, and and so forth. And we went over the border to that place. Um, I can't remember the town. That's a kind of a, up on the hill. Cross Hill. Uh, yeah, cr Cross Hill, and we're getting the, the gear out of the van, as, and suddenly the, 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 the army arrived. I mean, it was amazing. And said, so, what on earth are you doing here? But then I, I looked up the road. I, I don't know if you remember this, Neil. And, and um, Forrest Whitaker wasn't involved at all. But walking up the road was a, a black man. Basketball I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, it was um, six most foot six guy with huge... It Yellow earphones up and down the road. Yeah, it was the weirdest thing in the middle of no, of nowhere in the north of Ireland. It was most. He worked. He worked somewhere there, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was a big adventure. But what I do remember, there was so little money that I would be shooting some sequences, and the uh, the sound guy was arguing with one of the gaffers or something, and. I was trying to shoot something and they were trying to be really quiet, so they were having this silent argument. And I turned around and one was trying to stab the other with a stab. <laughs> Without saying a word, you know. <laughs> so it was quite stressful. You know, Get the catering truck first. Probably for the only piece of steak that was on the... Uh... Yeah, I know. <laughs> There's wonderful humour in the writing, I think, of, the, of, of this Thank film. You. Thank you. Yes, I really, really... Uh, um, I mean, some of uh, when um, Jody goes for goes for a pee. It's a wonderful yeah. sequence that between himself and Steve and Stephen. It's um, uh, well, it's very funny. It's very logical. He yes, can't take the handcuffs off, so he's got to unzip him and all that but stuff. The, so it's it, and it's so interesting watching the film, knowing the, the, yeah, the, the yeah. when you watch it the second time round. And I think you said you're 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 surprised when you see it again that people hadn't guessed, more people hadn't guessed that she was... Well, I was surprised that nobody had ever told a story, like a love story, where, you know, apart from some like it hot or something like that, you know, where, where somebody fell in love with somebody who was a man, you know, not knowing that, you know. Mm. It's a kind of obvious thing to do, really, isn't it? Now it, it seems so, but now that it's done, Neil Jordan has done it. So no, but the entire history of cinema up to <laughs> yes, that point, yeah. I mean, it does seem, you know, it seems odd that it seems like not, not a very original mm. kind of hook for a story, does it really? But they hadn't, so. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, uh, do you mind if I, um, Luke, if I, if I call on you for a moment, because I think what uh, uh, Robert said there, that when the lights came up, Irish film was a different beast. Um, just the role, uh, Luke I know from DC when we studied Angel, together um, many years ago so the crying game i know that um, i mean the role the crying game has played in in irish film culture well it, what's kind of interesting is how at the time a film like the miracle which was in the sense seen by many people as a turning point as well but the remarkable thing is that the miracle took off in certain ways but not at all to the extent that the crying game did and the question about the distribution of the crying game and when miramax moved in i mean maybe you might say something about that name because a lot of yeah. the issue has to do with there's a, a wonderful short film that um, orson wells made when he was had a day off with mclean or and edwards and it's called return to glenna skull and it's a kind of a ghost story and they made it apparently in 24 hours but it starts with orson wells with a broken car, with a, a car that has broken down by the wayside and these women come up and ask him, well, what's his problem? And he said, the distributor. Yeah. <laughs> he says, we often have, tr we have a lot of trouble with the distributors. Yeah. <laughs> and with Orson Welles smiling as only he could. And in a sense, Neil, I think that's one of the most remarkable things about the film in some ways that 
Is, is the, the marketing you yeah, mean? The, the, market, the yeah. way in which the film, and it's not so far from taking from the film. In mm. some ways, mm. I mean, great films are not just of their moment, mm. but they are kind of anticipations of what's to come. The Ireland we're now in, who could have told that an Ireland of multiculturalism? An Ireland in which Dublin City Council last evening uh, voted for same-sex marriages. Uh, who, who could have told that 20 years, that the very Ireland that was so kind of strange and so unfamiliar in that movie was actually being anticipated in Look, it's movie. still very strange. <laughs> well, <laughs> it really, it's really strange. Well, I think Dublin City Council might have a look at it. <laughs> but, but Dean, could you say something about how the film then picks up momentum when Harvey, when, when the... Well, no, no, I mean, basically, um, <laughs> Harvey bought the film, he saw it in Cannes, and uh, he didn't like the title, he wanted to call it The Soldier's Wife, which is the original title of it, and um, <clears throat> I asked him, could I write, would it be possible for me to write to critics to find if there was any way in which they would be able to talk about the movie without saying what happened in the plot, you know? And uh, so I wrote this letter to the main New York crit uh, critics in America, and the, surprisingly they all did, you know, and uh, he's, he has a kind of a genius for creating an event, Harvey and his brother Bob, you know, and they, they turned that into a kind of a roller coaster bandwagon business, you know, but uh, I think the only reason that critics complied initially was because they liked the film so much and they thought that uh, they should preserve the, you know, the the central surprise in it. So then it became known as the film of the surprise, and I think when people saw the movie, when Forrest's character was killed, they thought, oh, that's the surprise, okay, I've seen it coming, you know what I mean? And so it's, the, the anyway, it became that kind of event, but it's, uh, you know, I mean, that's marketing, isn't it? You know? And are you glad, obviously glad of its success, but that as a, as a writer and all the time you've spent developing it obviously in writing and in production that the power of marketing and the marketing and the necessity of it is it mm. is it um were you glad to have come up with the yeah. surprise or did you oh, find that it was reduced to the surprise? oh there was a lot of people then a lot, of, a lot there was a lot of comment on um people who write about films saying this was a form of fascism you know they weren't allowed to discuss the themes of this of the film correctly and the merrimax were basically uh you know, bullying the intellectual kind of community into not discussing the themes in the movie, and perhaps that may have been true too, you know, but it's... Um, Were you I accused of it being a gimmick at all? A gimmick? I don't know, I don't remember yeah, actually, yeah. I don't remember. Probably, but some people didn't like it, you know, but it's... Uh, now the thing that happened with the movie was it, it became a staple of all these courses in gender studies in America, you know, of which in every literary department turned into the gender study department quite quickly it seemed you know and uh, it kind of became the center of a broader discussion about politics and sexuality and what even if there is such a thing that you can define as sexuality as male and female and all that and I really welcomed that it was it was lovely to have a film that's kind of part of a, a broader kind of sociological discussion you know Neil, one of the things that does come up in the movie and that was seized upon in numerous university departments, including DCU, Darvel, was the, the, the tension between nature as destiny, between biology as destiny, which, which is coded in in some ways to the fr frog and the scorpion story. And yet the whole film is really contesting that, about whether biology is destiny and whether gender is even shaped yeah or whether you've fallen in love with somebody's hair or with you know the, the what's behind the hair or whether what is the shape of their hair is what they are do you understand what i mean i mean so it's about the object of desire in a way isn't it and it's about um anyway that's a broader discussion i think um you uh, there were there was some criticism from some quarters about the character of um Miranda Richardson's character, and um, some uh, women who found 
uh, who yeah. accused you of misogyny and some and some members of the Republican movement who mm. accused you of fascism. So uh, where years later, where are you on that that uh, that her character turns up in London looking quite well? That was world? quite that was quite decided. You know that was that was. I mean, we I wanted her to have those kind of padded shoulders and that really noirish kind of look and the hairdo and everything. You know, it's like she was she was a femme fatale out of a out of a Billy, oh sorry, out of a, uh, what's his name? Like, Who wrote The Postman Always Rings Twice, what's his no, name? Andrew. James N. Cain, you know, she was out of a James N. Cain novel in a way, and uh, that was a decided thing, you know, so the criticism is justified if people objected to it, you know, the men were feminized and the women were masculized, yes. if that's such a word, you know, you know, but that was, that was what the subject was. And what about the, um, uh, Members of the Republican movement. There's some lovely interviews on the um, on the the making of the film of the the guys the the guys who who loved it and the guys said oh, that that wouldn't happen in, in in real life. Well, of course it wouldn't happen. Yeah. Right? No, no. But it was. Uh, it, I mean, I suppose the the main thing I was accused of actually was of humanizing a you know a the people this a figure who everybody thought should be demonized. You know, but uh, I think. The movie is a response to the kind of change that was going on in Irish political culture at the time, you know. And, um, you know, I always felt the problem with terrorism is not that these people are monsters. The problem is precisely that they are human beings, that human beings can do these kind of things. And that's the issue to probe and to inquire into, you know. And, Neil, are, do you think ideas are of their time? Are could that film be made now? Obviously, the you know the the Good Friday Agreement has changed has changed yeah. things in Northern Ireland. But in terms, of even as a writer, when you come up with an idea and the development of an idea and how long you well, I mean, yeah, no a film like that could be made now. I mean, Steve McQueen made Hunger, didn't he? And uh, he took the fact of somebody starving themselves to death and made it into a a thing that was absolutely not about the political events surrounding the hunger strike, you know. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting movie about the human body and about a certain kind of desire for obliteration or something like that, you know. So, I mean, I, I think absolutely people could make a similar film at the moment. I haven't seen, is it called Shadow Dancer? I haven't seen that yet. But it's interesting that people are making films, you know, about that conflict with the benefit of about 20 years hindsight. There's, for some reason, they're still making them, you know. And did the movie change your life? The success, winning the Oscar, the... Oh, yeah, I, I don't know really. It, it, I mean, after that I did Interview the Vampire. Mm -hmm. And after I did Interview the Vampire, Warner Brothers allowed me to make Michael Collins, you know, so it... And then um, Warner Brothers as well paid for The Butcher Boy. Yeah, so it enabled me to make three movies that I really wanted to make, you know. And... Um, Actually, Interview the Vampire was a big Hollywood movie, but it was, you know, that, you know, by... And it, but I think it's the, the movie itself seems like it was made 100 years ago. The, this, the crime Just because of the, the cinematic environment into which it was released, that doesn't exist anymore. And that's what's rather sad, I think, you know. You know, the whole culture of uh, cinema going has changed so radically that it's almost shocking to think of the way we could release that movie then. Yeah. Mm. Um, Ian Power, I, I, are you in the audience? Yeah, Ian, because um, I mean, you have a beautiful quote here, I will uh, let you speak, but as, as, a young, as a young filmmaker with the success of, of your film, um, uh, I, I mean, just uh, something here. Time. Uh, when you start out making movies, you look at successful directors and you think, "I could do that." Most of Neil's films, you look at and you think, "How did he do that? Where is he coming from?" Yeah, I mean, uh, I obviously didn't work on the film. I've only made one film myself. Uh, I suppose, I suppose, really, I owe you a thank you for you know f effectively painting the canvas white. Uh, in terms of what people expect from an Irish film, um, I think it's a huge film that's in term, from the point of view of expectation, um, and also I suppose thank you for from the point of view of inspiration because, uh, you know, the film itself 
is so cinematic. I think it's possibly the, your most cinematic film, and yet there's such clarity between the way you write and the way you direct that never seems to be interrupted by either medium. I don't know, is there a point at which you're thinking about one more than the other? or it's No, like not really, no. But uh, thank you for saying that, by the way. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. No. But the, I mean, the strange thing that people don't notice about the film is that the first third of it is a play. Yeah. You know, and it's, a, it's almost a Frank O'Connor short story. In fact, I robbed it from Frank O'Connor, <laughs> uh, from Brenda Behan, and nobody's mentioned that fact, you know. But yeah, it, I, again, I think it's because how you, you handle the subject matter, it feels so cinematic, it's so emotionally huge within that, within that glass house, and then how it ends with raining down bullets, and you know, it, it, it does feel like a short film with, within itself. That must mean time is up. Our money has run out of the slot. <laughs> um, uh, any other questions from the audience before... Um, before we wrap up, yes, please. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know of the uh, Michael Well, no, I've 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 shot three or four or five movies in that specific place because I used to go, I used to hang around there when I was a kid, you know. And um, there is a bridge there. I'm, anytime I'm stuck for an emotional environment to stick a scene in, I always think of that place, oh, I'll put it there, you know, so, I mean, I used, I shot on the same, exactly the same strand in Angel, and I shot on the same bridge in Michael Collins, and we placed the, um, we placed the carnival there for, for the crying game, you know, but I suppose just because I know the place, you know, when I knew if we put the carnival there, I could put the camera on the bridge and do that big tracking shot, that's the opening of the film, you know. I know there you were saying, uh, you read from one of the crew members, they said it was magical, the opening scene. What, what do you remember about that scene or filming in late time? What are your memories? Well, Alfred Hitchcock said once that uh, he saw a girl, what was it? He saw a guy standing in one of these booth-like urinals, you know, and he was having a pee and his hand was hanging outside the canvas and the girl was still holding his hand and Hitchcock said he thought that was the definition of true love. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, so that's what you remember? Well, that, that's why I had them do that little thing, you know, but... Um, what do you mean? What do I remember? No, it's just, um, over the past week I've been asking all the locals, everyone took part, apart from me, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. And they just glow and they remember with the excitement, the fun, the cold. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, and they remember yeah. all your crew very, very yeah. fondly, they said they were brilliant down to earth. And I just thought, well I wonder what you remember about the shoot down there. I don't remember that much about it. <laughs> seriously, no, seriously, I don't, you know, that's the truth, you know. I remember choosing the place, yeah. I remember putting the car there. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and, and finally, uh, Neil, when you started out, the, there was little or no money, lots of ambition and no, no uh, finance. And um, I think, again, you referred to lots of pe The directors of the day you worked in the theatre was like working with Brahms and wanting to be working with the Beatles. Um, I mean, much has changed. And yet, many people would say it's still as difficult. Yeah, it's very. It's much. It's difficult. Yeah, you know. And a lot of the energy that used to go into independent movies has now gone into these American cable shows, which we were mm. talking about earlier. You know. And uh, um, I don't know. It's. It's. Uh, I. I say to my kids. I got. I live with two boys, seventeen and twenty. You know. I say to them about two or three times a week. Let's go see a movie. And they say, Nah, no. I think we'll sit and look at something on our computers, you know. So the world has changed a bit, I think. And from the privilege of experience and uh, success and also all the, um, the hardships of getting out there and writing it and making it, have you any advice for filmmakers out there? For Ian's second film, for my first film? Oh yeah, film? no, it, it's, it's about art, you know, it's not about anything else, you know. It's not about popularity or it's not even about cinema in the end it's just about art pure and simple I think you know